Well, I can't believe I'm here with John Cooper from Skillet. I grew up listening to you guys. All right. And um, I've never interviewed you in person. Good. I'm yes. so glad you grew up listening to us. That's so cool. Yes, and still do, still do. Oh, good. That was what I was going to ask yes. you. Because this interview was going to be over. <laughs> you were going to walk out. I was going to walk right out of here. But we're good. But you guys formed so much of my childhood, so it's just so cool <laughs> to really, you know, that the music you listen to is so formative when you're little, especially, so. Absolutely. It, it definitely is. That's an honor. Thanks so much. Absolutely. So you are known for being so bold in your faith um, and speaking out about hot button issues that are so pertinent to the church right now. So what drives this boldness? And how did you get into this space from sort of the CCM world? Yeah, it's very interesting. You know, when I first started Skillet, I mean, my, my mission was to be bold for Christ, evangelism, play this loud, aggressive music, and write about things that I believe in. You know, maybe it's, a, uh, sometimes people say an on-ramp. Maybe it's an on-ramp to the gospel. Or for people that are like, I don't really want to go to church, may, and, but maybe they would hear a song, and maybe it might spark their interest. And maybe they go online, they find an interview or something, and you never know what God might do. That was kind of the idea. Things started kind of changing for me around 2012 and 13. And I, I, I'm, I'm probably going to embarrass myself, show some naivety here, but it's basically this. When I first started Christian music, I was so naive. I thought that anyone who said they were a follower of Jesus, that we all just agreed on most stuff. You know, certainly we would agree on the stuff that really matters, right? If we disagreed on stuff, it would be tertiary issues, of soteriology, means of salvation or something. But we're not actually going to be disagreeing on, is Christ the only way to heaven? We're not going to disagree about, did Christ actually raise from the dead? Ethics, morality, things that we've always thought the Bible was clear about. When I started noticing that change in around 2012 and 13 in the Christian music world, I, I just didn't understand what was happening. So it wasn't like I recognized it and spoke to it. I didn't recognize it. And I was like, what is going on? So that is kind of why I started speaking out. Once I finally understood what was happening, it took me several years. I was like, oh, I, I didn't realize that's what this is. We are actually at a, a, we're at a really important place in Christianity, in the faith. I think a real crossroads about the gospel that we hand down to our children. What is that gospel going to look like? How is Christianity going to even be defined? What are the tenets of the faith going to be? That's why I started speaking out so boldly about things. Most of the time, what I notice is that it's a culture issue that ends up driving someone to more of a liberal theology. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a culture. It's, it's a sexual issue. Mm -hmm. It's a, well, my friend so-and-so... Uh, they're going through a divorce because, you know, he had an affair or this, and maybe that's whatever. And then it drives them to a leftward theology rather than facing the issue that, that's happening. Or it's an issue of culture that's just not popular, uh, uh, pro-life or something, something like that. And then you feel like you're a really mean person because you're forcing a woman to get to, to have a baby, you know, or whatever it is. And I might not be saying this very articulately, but what I mean is it's the unpopularity of the issue of abortion makes people go, well, maybe I don't want to, maybe I'll just think this. And before you know it, you, your theology has is, is really drifted left. That's why I started speaking out. Yeah, I think you're so spot on. We are such a feelings-driven culture. There's not much room for biblical truth anymore, even in the church. <laughs> yes, it's very interesting. I mean, I, I think it took me a long time to understand that because I didn't know. I mean, I'm, I'm feelings-based too. I'm a musician. So I've written things. I look back and I go, was that the best way to say that? Probably not. You know, it's what I was feeling about God. It was what, maybe it wasn't the best. It's art and it's sometimes art can be interpretation driven, you know, it, it starts a conversation, but, but we shouldn't think that truth is, is fungible. The art might be interpreted in different ways, but it doesn't mean the truth is fungible. So I, I get the feelings based thing, but I didn't know that it would get to a place where people would say, I'm going to base my theology on my feelings and I'm going to admit it. And that's how far it's gone. I think people go, yeah, but is the Bible actually the word of God or is it just a template, guys? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and the reason I say it's my naivety is that this isn't the first time we've seen this. This is a recurring thing in history, of course. At the time, I didn't know that. So from 2012 to about 16, uh, 2016, for those four years, I was just consuming books, 
history, theology, uh, uh, philosophy, social science, critical theory, trying to understand how we got to this place. And then I went, oh, okay, all this is is the same liberal theology that we dealt with 100 years ago, mm -hmm. the same sort of ideas of antinomianism that uh, Spurgeon fought in the downgrade. You know, It just comes back around, and now it's our time to fight it. Yeah. So absolutely. stand up, people. <laughs> yep. I'm so interested because you, um, you know, you you were at, you've been in CCM for so many years, and I grew up on CCM, and we've seen just in recent years so many big names in CCM, John Steingard from Hawk Nelson, Marty Sampson from uh, Hillsong. We're seeing them deconstruct. I want to pick your brain on what is the relationship between deconstruction and kind of this Christian music world of the late 2000s, of the mid 2000s, early 90s. Um, is there a connection? And if so, what is it? Right. It's funny. I don't know. I mean, what I would say is this. I mean, even recently, as I've come out and, and said some things about deconstruction, there's been some pushback and there have been people who have, not, who have deconstructed over the last 10 years from Christian, uh, the Christian faith, Christian music, um, left the Christian faith. So I mean, fully deconstructed, deconverted apostate mm -hmm. that now have platforms, social media platforms. And, they, and what they try to do is preach their new kind of version. They try to sow in doubt and unbelief into, into Christian people. When I've said things recently about deconstruction, some of those people who are apostates have come on their social media platforms, said disparaging things about me. Uh, which I don't mind at all. Mm -hmm. But there are people in the Christian music industry who liked their posts. So we're talking about some of the biggest people, Christian radio promoters it, within Christian music that liked their post mm -hmm. and then also posted comments that were disparaging to me. They are taking the side of an apostate, mm -hmm. someone who now attacks the faith. That is an enemy of the faith, an enemy of the church, an enemy of the gospel, it's not just the musicians, it's the whole industry. I mean, I wrote a book, Awaken Alive to Truth, just to give people an idea. I want people to understand, I'm not mad about any of the, about this. I'm just trying to give an, an example of where we're at. Mm -hmm. So my band Skillet, we have 5 million Facebook f friends, 3 million YouTube followers, right? A million followers on Instagram. And I wrote a book that no major Christian publisher would publish. Mm -hmm. I've got a huge platform, right? Wouldn't publish it, but not because I was saying stuff that was too crazy. It's because I was saying things that are too orthodox. So these same publishers will publish someone a lot less famous than me, sell less books, make less money, and print heresy at the same time. But they won't print a book from me that is just talking about n nothing that would be um, nothing that would be controversial for any like lowest common denominator evangelical, right? You could be Calvinist, Arminius, post, mill, pre-mill. Uh, you could be all those things in, in nothing controversial. Original sin, why Jesus died, why you cannot trust your emotions. The word of God is the authority of scripture, the divinity of scripture as J.I. Packer calls it. Not just authority, the divinity of scripture. This is not controversial stuff for the faith, yet it is now. So there is a relationship happening. Yes, there's something happening within Christian music, but it's not just Christian music. It's not just the artists. It's the people, uh, the labels. It's the radio people. I'm telling you, if we, if we, if, if, if I said today, we're going to make a lowest common denominator creed that you have to agree with to play Christian music, well, we'd see 40% of the industry gone tomorrow. Wow. And if you added in sexual ethics to it, I think you'd lose, I bet there'd be 30% le uh, left. Mm. My, my guess is 30% of the industry still holds to what we would call traditional biblical sexual ethic. That's my guess. Wow. I bet if we did that with pastors in America, people would be stunned I bet we'd be talking about 50% of pastors that would not feel comfortable signing something that held to biblical sexual ethics, traditional views, I should say. Wow. I think you're spot on. I was talking to Keith Getty recently, and he said something that was both funny and alarming. He said, the pe so many of the people that write Christian music, you wouldn't trust to teach your children's Sunday school class. Yes, that's right. That's 100% accurate. Now, uh, just to be clear, there are some amazing people as well, friends of mine that I look up to, that I respect. They, they are absolutely there, uh, without a doubt. But it is very alarming. It's alarming that it's happening in the industry, the musicians, 
It's also alarming to me. I can't believe the things that I read pastors and and public people say on public Christian platforms um, that I used to read and trust. I can't believe the stuff they say, especially after just diving deep into the theology and the social sciences that are the social, the, they're really just, it's just humanism, just being bombed, just bombarded into Christianity. Just, mm. I can't believe the stuff that, that they write that's just not in line with historical Christianity, uh, certainly. Talk about some of these issues, though, because I think a lot of these ideas are sneaking into the church, but they're kind of shrouded in good language, like justice and equality and some of these biblical terms, um, but they're so dangerous. So talk about them and, and maybe how we can identify them. Well, there's really a lot of them. You know, so one of the things I'm good at, that, and probably is the reason I'm such a fire starter, it probably makes people mad when I don't even know I'm making someone mad. I just try to give them examples to say, think consistently, you know, what if this, then this, then this, and this. I mean, for instance, um, here's a good example. <laughs> You know, I live in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and after uh, the shooting of Jake, Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin, we had riots. I mean, we, we three blocks from my house were burned down to the ground, and there were social media things going out to four or five different states around us saying, we're coming to these neighborhoods or whatever, and we're going to blow the place up. So that was, that was known. The, and so... You know, I was on, <laughs> I was on TV. I was just saying, I can't believe this is America. My kids are here. They, they, I, we don't know what's going to happen. I just said, I'm going to have to sit up with my AR and I mean, make sure nobody tries to kill my family. That to me doesn't seem even like a controversial thing. I had friends that Christian friends that were just like, this is so unChristian. It's not about your rights and yada yada. Now they are the same people online praising Ukraine for defending their sovereign country. I, I'm like, you have no consistency. Why does Ukraine have more sovereignty over their country than I have over my family? This is just a misunderstanding of self-government. This is a misunderstanding of liberty under God's law. I and mean, we would say natural law under God, I guess you would say. That's just one random example. And some people might get really mad, but I always challenge them on their consistency. So if I don't have a right to to protect my family, then Ukraine doesn't have a right to protect Ukraine, right? It's the same type thing. All this stuff is coming in under guises of justice and and all these really, they're really bizarre. They're so bizarre that no one understands them unless you go to college. Mm -hmm. So you have to go to college to even understand how they're coming to this, this very conclusion. And some of it comes from a good place of people that recognize there's been incredible injustice in, in America for centuries. And, and that is absolutely true. And there are still effects of those things. Um, and out of a maybe a good heart of wanting to do something about that, then they end up jumping into something that I'm like, well, I don't know if, I don't really know if, if you understand what, what this could end up looking like, how this can, can really rip the church apart and how this can really, you know, um, destroy America. Another good example is just simply this. There's a lot of, of Christians, a lot of pastors going very soft on the issue of abortion. And that is, again, coming from, from the humanistic point of view that, that really at the bottom of it says that, in your oppressor and oppressed matrix of neo-Marxism and it's and all the various thoughts, mm -hmm. well, then this child is sort of an oppressor to the mom. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's this idea of well, men don't have to go through that, so a woman can have true uh, equality with a man because this affects her in a way it could never possibly affect a man. So this this child is actually living off the life force of a mother without her without her um, giving the okay. That's sort of the idea of this thing. Now, obviously, that's not a Christian point of view, but because of that, where you're ending up now is, I think, a lot of pastors maybe that meant well um, going soft on the issue of abortion, saying, no, no, we're still against abortion, but we have to also be for the rights of the mother. That is a code word of saying we're going to stop caring so much about this issue because the world doesn't look at it like that anymore. You know, So now it's an issue of justice. It's an issue of justice that we make sure that a woman has free and easy access to abortion. And if not, that's another way the patriarchy is oppressing uh, women. Yeah. 
That's astounding. Well, and we're seeing the ramifications of that. I've been using this statistic that um, the head of some ministries just shared with me that 4%, just 4% of, of young people in the church have a biblical worldview. In the church. Yes. Right? That's not even mainstream culture, and that should sober us. It absolutely should. It absolutely should sober us. I mean, I think that some of it. This is just my opinion. I don't know if I'm right or not. This is just my experience. I would say, you know, my experience is that at the end of the '90s and as as the turn of the millennia came, a lot of us, and I will put myself in this category, so I'm not pointing my finger at everybody else. This is me too. A lot of us were going, "How can we reach the world for the gospel of Jesus?" We don't need another worldview class. We don't need another Bible class. We don't need another, well, Jesus came to do a, you know, a um, propitiation for my sins and another atonement sacrament. People don't know what that means. We just need to understand why is it good for people to want to know Jesus? Mm-hmm. And that we are seeing the negative, <laughs> the negative fruits of that now. It's not to say that it's not important to understand why is it, why why is why is Christ relevant to them. How can Christ reach down into their pain? All that is is important, but because of that, we started sort of diminishing the importance of worldview. And I put myself in that category. We diminish the importance of understanding what the divinity the divinity of Scripture, why that even matters, mm-hmm. and then. That, that Christ has something to say about the whole world. There's no aspect of your life that he doesn't have something to say about COVID, <laughs> mandates, your job, your parenting, your your spouse, the, you know, uh, politics, law, the civil realm. Either Christ is Lord of everything, or you're saying there's a sliver of the pie that he's not Lord over and that he doesn't speak to. That's just a neutral territory. And we are seeing the we are really seeing bad, bad fruit from thinking that there was a lot of neutral areas. Mm-hmm. Neutral area would be something like education, mm-hmm. as if you can just teach education without a bent towards either Christian education or a bent towards humanistic education. Politics is another thing. Christians, oh, we don't want to get political. That's not God's realm. So Christ is not the Lord of of, of the civil realm. Is that what you mean? Or do you think that he is the Lord and he may have something to say about it? We may disagree, but he has something to say about it and we should dig down to find out what that is. So I think that that's a mistake we made and it has led us to a place where we no longer believe that the scriptures are authoritative. So if we read a scripture and the scripture says, you know, this and that, either you do this or you do that. A wise man does fill in the blank. A foolish man does fill in the blank. We're now at a time when a great many Christians go, yeah, but that's kind of extreme. Yeah. There's a big neutral gray area, God. <laughs> and God's like, no, there's not. That's why I wrote it that way. Yeah, that's really good. Well, I want to end on a note of encouragement because, you know, there's a lot to be discouraged about, but there's also a lot to be encouraged about. So why can we have confidence in where the church is going and hope for the next generation of believers? Oh, I would love to have a word of encouragement. Great idea. So everybody ends this is horrible. <laughs> you know what? The fact that it is horrible is where I would probably say is where the encouragement is coming, because you can't just keep um, you can't just keep. How do you want to say it? Keep, the Bible would say kicking against the goads. You you can't just keep going, pushing and pushing and pushing against. How do I want to say this? The design of the kingdom. There's a there's a flow of the kingdom of God. Let's say it this way. There's a flow of the kingdom of God. God says, this is how my world is created. Two plus two equals four. When you do this, this happens, right? The wise man does this. The foolish man does this. And when you are in the flow of the kingdom of God, then you have order in your life. Christ is Christ is the Lord and Christ brings order to your the chaos of your life. But if you kick against the goads and you keep, you know, kicking against the kingdom, the it's going to kick back, you know? And so what I say is we're devolving into chaos. We're just getting worse and worse and worse and worse. At some point, people will begin to say, okay, what we're doing it just ain't working. It's just not working. So what do we do about that now? And so a word of encouragement is that sometimes you have to see the chaos in order to recognize, all right, this, is, this isn't going good. I will say, I, I, I feel like I'm already starting to see that. We're on tour now. The amount of young people giving their lives to Christ uh, at the tour we're on is astounding. I've never seen anything like it in my music career. Um, the percentage of people coming, uh, giving their life to Jesus, it's almost like they're seeing it now. 
when you live in a, in a world where nothing means anything, there's no, there's no male, there's no female, there's no sex. Uh, there's no, it, it's like everything's changing every week. They are feeling this incredible anxiety. I mean, why wouldn't you, you know? I feel so bad for young people. Imagine growing up right now as a young person and being like, whatever I thought was true today might, might be untrue tomorrow. And then I might be yelled at for saying it a day too late, canceled, taken off of social media or whatever the next thing may be. That's going to devolve to a place where all of a sudden people will finally realize this is not working and we need a new answer. And that's why Christians, we need to, we need to get sharp on the word of God. We get sharp on the word of God to say, that's going into chaos because you are doing that. You know, the Bible is really clear, but it's not really a mystery. The Bible is very clear about a lot of it. And so I've just found an immense amount of peace believing the Bible, seeing it play out in culture. You speak to it and eventually people, are, their, their eyes are going to open. They say, oh, I see that maybe the Bible is real. And that's when we need to swing those nets, swing those nets wide. Yep. Amen. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me. I really appreciate it. Really appreciate your voice and culture. We need it. Oh, thank you very much. I loved being here.